afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining How to Avoid and Treat Extraction Complication in Dogs and Cats with Dr. Gary Goldstein. I'm Nicole Cass, CE Program Manager for the MVMA, and I'm pleased to be your moderator for this afternoon's sessions. If you do have any questions during the Lunch and Learn, please type them in the Q&A area. A quick review or introduction to the WebEx platform so you can actively participate. If you place your cursor on the screen, along the bottom you'll see a series of circles. Look for the black circle with the three dots. If you click on it, you will see Q&A. Click on that and a small window or pod will appear and you can begin typing a question and or response. I would like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Gary Goldstein. Dr. Goldstein is the Chief Medical Officer at Lakeview Veterinary Group a private, family-owned veterinary practice that owns and operates veterinary hospitals in specific markets to better support the hospitals. Prior to joining Lakefield Veterinary Group, Dr. Goldstein was Professor, Section Head of Veterinary Dentistry and Oral Surgery Service, and Associate Medical Director at the University of Minnesota's Veterinary Medical Center. He was responsible for medical operations, strategic planning, and implementation of medical standards. He also implemented, implemented leading cutting edge didactic and clinical programs that fostered innovation, teamwork, and continuing education programs. I'd like to now turn it over to Dr. Goldstein. Great, thank you very much, Nicole. That was a nice introduction. Um, I'm hoping everybody can hear me. Um, if not, I'm sure Nicole will text me and let me know. But I just wanted to talk about uh, for the next 45 or 50 minutes or so, maybe leave some questions or time for questions. Uh, just some common ways on how we can avoid and treat extraction complications. Some of them are, are pretty obvious. Um, some of them maybe not so obvious. I hope that um, after the discussion today, I can give you at least a handful of tricks um, and pearls of wisdom, if you will, but tricks to kind of help prevent uh, some of the uh, complications that we see. It's not all inclusive. Obviously, any of us can talk probably eight hours on how to avoid the extraction complications, but I wanted to give you just some, some really um, high level, easy things that you can do in your practices that will help. Uh, one thing is that um, for those of you that uh, knew me at the university, uh, Dr. Klima was my first dental resident uh, way back when. And so some of these slides, not all of them, but a handful of them, um, are from him, so I just wanted to at least thank him publicly for some of the information, some of the slides that uh, that we have uh, in the in the program. So I'm just going to get started. So the first thing that we need to do um, when we do any extractions is to breathe. It's really important um, if you're in a hurry, if you're rushed, um, if you have appointments, you know, starting at one o'clock, and you have two more dental procedures to do, and you find out there's four extractions or ten extractions. Uh, you, you really can't rush um, extractions. You, you really need to be careful um, and be very, um, oh, essentially breathe. You just need to be patient is, is what you need. So, so that being said, uh, some of the complications we see um, are avoidable, some are not. So excessive bleeding, uh, the best example, of course, would be if, if you put a, a root tip in the mandibular uh, or a mandibular premolar, for example, fractures, it goes into the mandibular canal, you're gonna get quite a bit of bleeding. Or um, if you're extracting an upper fourth premolar or first and second molar, um, and you're penetrating the elevator too far and you get into the maxillary sinuses, um, that can cause excessive bleeding. Most will stop, obviously, but that's one of the complications and that's uh, in part why we want to close most of, if not all the flaps that we create. Uh, another complication is the dehiscence of a flap. Uh, I'm going to talk with you about some techniques that works for that work for me. Uh, but the bottom line with the gingival flap is that you need to make it wide enough um, and large enough to be able to close that site. And you need to be able to elevate the alveolar mucosa so that you don't have to stretch it over. It just lays over that extraction site. That's probably the most important point of uh, making a surgical flap. You want to avoid soft tissue trauma. So several of my slides, and I have some in, I have some information on instrumentation um, that I think will help you as well. But using a, a University of Minnesota lip retractor, which I'll show you uh, later on, 
that is going to just pull that soft tissue away so that you don't have to, um, or at least prevent um, as much as you can that burr uh, from touching that tissue. Um, so you want to avoid soft tissue trauma. The other thing too is that if you have a really inflamed uh, flap of tissue that you want to close, and you think that the flap is that you put the needle through the flap and you think it's too large of a bite, just use that because if you pull the needle out and make it a smaller bite, then you're just going to irritate that tissue even more. It's already inflamed, and so by putting more holes in that tissue, uh, you're going to have a hard time closing that. Uh, fractured roots, we know uh, obviously we, we do that often. Um, I'm no different than anybody else, so I'm going to give you some techniques about how to avoid. Uh, proactively fracturing roots. Uh, what happens if you put a root tip into the nasal cavity or the mandibular canal? Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how to prevent that as much as we can. Uh, you want to make sure that when you're using um, a burr, a, a cutting burr, that you have plenty of water. Um, if you don't have a lot of water because you think you can't really visualize much, um, if you use a cutting burr to remove bone, section teeth, um, and remove that buccal bone, then you could potentially could get osteonecrosis um, or bone necrosis because there's just not enough water supply. Uh, we're going to talk just a tad about fracturing jaws, what you can do to prevent that. Um, as I've said, uh, I, I've done all of these things over the years, so I'm no, no different than anybody else. Um, but certainly, uh, for example, uh, in a lower canine tooth in a cat, you may want to remove 75% of the bone versus 50% of the bone. Uh, that's going to prevent fracture in that jaw. Um, so you don't have to just make sure that you need to remove more bone if you need to. And of course, the pathological fractures, uh, the lower first molar uh, we see often, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, the orbital penetration, where I'm going to talk about this is that with that first upper molar and second molar, uh, and just some techniques on what you need to do to prevent the elevator going up into the orbit or in that area. Um, retain roots in, in cats, obviously, with tooth resorption, a lot of the retain roots are uh, from tooth resorption, so that's okay. But if you fracture a root tip in a healthy um, dog or cat, uh, but especially with the dog and there's no significant tooth resorption and it's from periodontal disease or a fractured tooth, you need to do all you can uh, to remove those root fragments, and I'll give you some hints about how to do that. Um, alveolar osteitis, we don't, I don't think, see very much. Uh, everybody talks about it. Basically, it's, it's what people would call an open socket, um, and the argument here is that we need to close everything um, so we can form that clot, and then we suture the flap over that clot to form bone. There are some cases, like an upper first or second molar, where if there's severe periodontal disease and there's already healing going on, uh, I oftentimes will leave that open. I'm not, I know not everybody does that. Um, so if there's advanced periodontal disease, severe, for example, the upper first or second molar, I do not always suture that close. But what I will do is that if there's a flap of tissue, I'll do my very best to oppose that, um, but I don't go to all extremes to close that flap. So um, moving on, uh, some things to implement to prevent uh, complications. The biggest thing is that um, I would not use a spring-loaded mouth gag, uh, especially in cats. The, the mouth, spring-loaded mouth gag puts pressure uh, in the TMJ area, um, and I'll show you where it's, it's worse in cats. Um, and so we need to make sure that we don't use spring-loaded mouth gags. Uh, there are, you know, back in the day, um, I used to take a 3cc syringe casing and I would you know, cut it off and use that as mouth gags. Um, so number, number two, you always want to take pre-dental radiographs. And the importance, and I'm going to give you a, a couple of examples, um, but you want to take pre-dental radiographs so you know what you're getting into and you can know ahead of time if, for example, the root is fractured, uh, even though there's severe periodontal disease, so the root is fractured, by taking preoperative radiographs, you can you can see and identify that fractured root so that you know that you may have to remove more bone um, ahead of time. I would always get in the habit of taking postoperative radiographs. You want to make sure, even if you can see the, the entire tooth root, uh, it's, a, it's a good good habit to get into um, to take postoperative x-rays. There may be pieces of alveolar bone. There may be material in that socket. You want to make sure that that socket is completely clean. 
Um, even though you can see the root, there may be pieces of I said alveolar bone that's left in there. And so I would always get in the habit of taking radiographs. If it's a cost thing, most of us are using digital radiographs. I would just do it for free uh, because it's, it's really the right medicine and the right thing to do. You want to make sure that there's adequate lighting. Um, when you get as old as I do, you can't see as well uh, close up. So you want to have um, surgical loops um, or some type of magnification with appropriate lighting. Um, oftentimes, people don't like to do dentistry because they're stuck in the corner. There's no uh, good lighting and there's no magnification um, to see the, the teeth and the roots. So I would make sure that you do that. Um, and the big thing with me anyway, is that you need to have a very, um, it has to be set up as an ergonomic seating. So I would, I recommend a saddle chair. Uh, I'll show you some examples with plenty of knee space. Um, again, as, as you get older um, and you're looking over the dentist, um, you know, in human dentistry, the dentists are looking over the patient. We are looking at the patient under anesthesia and you wanna make sure that ergonomically you're sitting straight up and we'll, we'll make sure that we go through that in a second. So if you're using mouth gags that are spring loaded, I would just get rid of those. And I would use uh, some examples that I'm gonna give you in just a second. But with, with what happens in, in cats is that, you know, oftentimes if you use a mouth gag, spring loaded or otherwise, it oftentimes will tighten the lips. And so we think that we need the mouth gag to, to visualize the teeth more effectively. Uh, but oftentimes if you do it too tight, you actually can't get to the dentition. And if you know, if you're in the dentist chair uh, and you always want to open wide, the dentist will oftentimes say, can you just relax a little bit? Because if it's too tight, then you don't have good visualization. And that's very, very important when you're trying to um, access teeth. So make sure that you don't always you know, stretch those out, even with a, a not a spring loaded. So here's what it looks like. Um, so there's a space, I don't know if you can see my, my mouse or not, but there's a space in the TMJ where the artery courses through that, what happens um, is that when, the, when there's a spring-loaded pressure and that jaw is open, that space there is going to be decreased where that yellow arrow is. Um, and that is uh, potentially going to block off that supply to the, to the, um, the orbital uh, blood supply. And what we sometimes will see, and I, 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 I hear this often, I've had, actually two or three questions and concerns just this last week and a half where they've had a dentistry procedure in a cat. They've used a spring-loaded mouth gag, um, and then the results are that the cat is blind. Generally speaking, um, when that happens, it is uh, temporary. Um, rarely is it permanent, um, but it still is not um, very encouraging for the, for the owner, obviously. So by opening that up, um, it just it just occludes that artery there, and so the take home message is don't use a spring loaded, um, use these mouth gags. And this is these are examples of um, the ones that I use and that I use at the university where they came in uh, three different sizes. It's very cheap. It's I think you can get 50 of them for less than ten dollars, and you can reuse them until they get lost. So I that this is what I would recommend. Um, through Dental Air is the only company that I know that sells those at this point. So taking on, uh, so pre-dental radiographs. So why that's important is that, you know, we can identify um, problems. So this is um, uh, a, a cat, um, looks like it's a cat. And you can see that the first, the you know, second premolar usually is one rooted, it's two rooted. You can see the, that last molar, um, it is, you know, it's malformed, it's malpositioned. Um, on the left, on the left of the radiograph. If you know that going in ahead of time, then you can prepare and plan your surgical extraction. This is a lower molar in a dog. We know normally that it has two roots. Um, if you were to extract this lower first molar for whatever reason, in this case, let's say it's a fractured, it's not from periodontal disease, you can see that there's that supernumerary root present here. If you know that ahead of time, um, it will make life a lot more easy because what you don't want to do is extract those two large roots and say you're done and not take a follow-up radiograph. And if you do take a follow-up radiograph, you're going to see that there's that supernumerary root. So this is really, really important. Um, something that I, I just actually noticed right this second is that that lower eight 
you can see, I hope you can see my arrow, um, but that, that mesial root, uh, if, if for some reason we were to extract that lower eight or the lower fourth premolar, um, I, would ex I would remove more buccal bone uh, because you can see that this distal root is relatively normal, but the mesial root is, uh, there's some a root resorption. So when you go to extract this mesial root, you can pretty much assure yourself that it's going to fracture right where that, that root is, is more narrow. If you know that ahead of time, then you would just uh, remove more buccal bone to gain better access to that mesial root, for example. Uh, this is just another example. We can see your arrow, so you know that. You, you can or you cannot? We can, yes. We oh, can good, see. because not all webinars you can. Okay, great. Thank you, Nicole. Um, so, perfect. So, here's an example where if you probe that lower first molar, you know, you may not see any probing depth except on this distal root. Well, then what do you do? You know, do you extract the lower first molar and the second molar? Um, but if you take radiographs, you can see there's almost 90 or 100% bone loss on that lower first molar. That needs to be extracted, but also you can see that there's quite a bit of widening of that peritoneal ligament here. So both of these uh, teeth need to be extracted. Um, if, if the owners are very, very concerned about extracting that lower first molar, um, what you can do is you can extract that second molar. Uh, this would be a referral, um, but you could section that first molar in half, remove or extract that distal root, and we do a root canal on that mesial root. And I've done that a lot of times. Um, it just depends on what the owner wants to do. So again, Looking ahead of time, or taking radiographs ahead of time, you would see something like this. So this would be, you know, there's varying degrees um, of this, but there's some, some osteo, what we call alveolar osteitis. We don't really know what the cause is. It's asymptomatic, generally speaking. We see that in people as well. Um, if you see something like this, it's just a matter of letting the owners know that there's a little bit of alveolar osteitis, and we just need to, to monitor that for signs of oral disease, such as oral pain, Drain tracts, swelling, et cetera. This is an example um, of hypercementosis. Again, there's nothing that you need to do. And if you have digital radiography and you know how to invert your radiograph, you can invert this and you can see that there's a peritoneal ligament space even all the way around. Uh, this is asymptomatic and I would not do anything. If we were to extract that tooth, we just know that this is going to be more of a problem, so I would extract more, or I would remove more buccal bone. In this other premolar, you can see that there's a fracture um, and we want to extract that, but again, taking radiographs ahead of time, we see that a distal root looks normal, but the mesial root here has severe root resorption. And so if you were to remove the bone and section that, uh, it would likely fracture off right here, um, and you, if you know that ahead of time, as I said, then you may want to remove more buccal bone because you can see how thin that root is. And so again, the point of these radiographs is that it's important to take preoperative x-rays. This was a case I saw at the university a while ago. Um, and, you know, there's quite a bit of gingivitis, plaque buildup, dogs not chewing very well, as you can see um, by the, the heavy calculus that's present. And there's some uh, percation exposure here. And so this is a Maltese, or usually we see them in Maltese. I think this is a smaller breed dog. Uh, but if you take a radiograph, you can see that these roots diverge. This is called root uh, dilaceration. If we can take full mob x-rays you know, initially uh, when the dog is uh, a couple years of age, when we do that, we would be able to identify these, the roots that are dilacerated, and we would prevent this severe, extensive, advanced periodontitis and potentially extract that tooth before it gets to this point. Is that, this is, a, I think, an, a 10 or 11, 12-year-old dog, and for all of his life, he or she has been dealing with his oral pain. Um, and it wasn't until the dog stopped eating and there was a, um, a track uh, right here that we could see, and there is when we, died, when we saw that. Of course, in my mind, it was a small breed dog. It's probably uh, dilaceration, so these need to be extracted. Uh, again, these are more extreme examples where on the left side, you can see that there's that lower molar that is the single root, which is 10, 
but you can see that impacted um, number two, or 11, I'm sorry, and you can see this is nine, and you can see that impacted 10. And, you know, it's just like an impacted uh, wisdom tooth, I guess. Uh, you just need to know that we can identify the root structure all the way around. The crown is evident here. Uh, that tooth, you know, if it's if this tooth is mobile and you extract that without taking preoperative X-rays, uh, you're going to miss that. And so, in this particular case, on the right, uh, we just were able to make a larger flap and remove that. So, um, again, intraoperative radiographs. It's important because if you fracture the root um, or the tooth uh, or you section it inappropriately, you want to find out where you are. So oftentimes, if I do fracture a root, um, and or when I do, I should say, um, I will take a radiograph right away so I have an idea that in this particular case, you know, it's there's a fracture down longitudinally, so I know I just have to remove more bone because I have a piece of tooth here and a piece of tooth here. This case here, we know right away that it's a fractured tooth, but it extends all the way down to probably 80% of the root, and there's a fracture here as well. So you know darn well that these will will come out reasonably well by removing enough bone, but that root here, the the, the, um, the palatal, uh, distal palatal root is gonna be more difficult, or should be, not distal palatal, the distal um, root is gonna be more difficult to extract because there's a fracture here, and there's a longitudinal fracture. The point is, is that taking pre radiographs is very, very important. Here's an example of an upper fourth premolar has severe uh, bone loss, periodontal disease, uh, periapical resorption. But taking a radiograph preoperatively, you can appreciate that this root here is, is fractured all the way across as well. Um, so it's going to break up right there. We know that ahead of time, and we just need to remove more bone to remove and extract that root. And then you also can see that the distal or the, um, the apical portion of this root, there's disease present as well. So you know that it's going to fracture right here. Um, so if you know that ahead of time, I think that's going to be much more effective for you. Um, again, these are just other examples of taking radiographs um, to prevent um, the angst that you have. Um, sometimes they're obvious like this, and sometimes on the right, they're not as obvious. You have an example like this, there's a, a, a missing tooth, um, or you go to extract that and you see that there's a root tip left in the nasal cavity. Um, most of us will go after that and retrieve that. Sometimes if it's really, in this case, you can probably retrieve it, but if it's very, very small, I personally take the more um, conservative approach. Um, I know not everybody does. Um, and so whether it's here in the nasal cavity or, um, I have some other pictures, um, or in the mandible, uh, I sometimes have to use my imagination to say, and ask myself if I'm going to cause more trouble. Um, if it's this big, it's usually able to be retrieved. Um, but oftentimes, in my experience, um, upper or lower, if it's in the nasal cavity and it's a real small root tip, you're going to cause more damage by going in and trying to grab it. And oftentimes, maybe not this big, but when they're smaller, they'll sneeze that out. So you also need to know what the pathology is before you do the surgery. So in this particular case, we know that the upper the jaw is really not fractured clinically, but obviously when you go to extract these teeth, um, you need you know that there's always going to be going to be a fracture there. So when you remove these teeth, that jaw is going to be more unstable. Um, if you take radiographs ahead of time and the jaw does fracture, then at least you have proof from the owner um, that or to the owner that actually the jaw was being held in place by the teeth and the calculus. In this particular case, and I think I have some other ones as well, um, like this particular case and this particular case, um, I would always, always, always section the roots. And especially in a situation like that, if you use the elevator to torque it, you risk breaking that jaw. So you know radiographically there's about 100% bone loss here. Once we section these, this tooth here, instead of using an elevator, I would just grab the, uh, this distal root with the forceps and I would twist on its long axis and hold it. And I think if you twist and hold, especially when you have this much bone loss um, and do less torquing with the elevator, you're gonna fracture the jaw less. Um, with, with this uh, mesial root, uh, that you can't really do 
very effectively. So you're going to have to remove a little bit more bone here to remove it. But in this particular case, um, or in this particular case here, once you section the roots, um, instead of using the elevator to torque it, I would um, use more of a forceps to twist and hold. The more radiographs that we take, the more times we're going to see this. Um, and I think most of us will, will believe that if we see a situation like this, which we see more and more of, then I actually have a whole lecture on this. But in this particular case, um, if there are clinically no periodontal pockets and there's no gum recession, um, there's no frication exposure, the teeth are not mobile at all, uh, then I would leave alone and let the owner let the owners know what you saw and that it's important for you to monitor with radiographs, uh, if not every six months, for sure every year. If they're mobile and there's frication exposure, uh, then in this particular case, knowing that this mid portion of the root is already being resorbed and being replaced by bone, the expectation is these tips here will continue to resorb. And I generally will just treat this as similar to what we do with cats um, and do a crown amputation. I do my best to remove most of that, but if we have tips like this, it's going to be difficult generally to remove that. So um, it, again, if you have ghost roots with mobility like this, then you need to treat them like a cat with tooth resorption. Okay. This is just a picture of us a couple years ago in Montana, um, trying to be um, trying to rough it, I guess. All right. So we're going to move on to the surgical extractions, and I'm just going to give you several hints. I know a lot of this is repetitive, but I'm telling you that um, with every single multi-rooted tooth, no matter if there's 100% bone loss or 20% bone loss, you should always section multi-rooted teeth. Uh, and I know, because it's happened to me as well, that when you think like an upper first molar is very loose or even, you know, even a premolar, um, you don't think you need to section it because they're very, very loose. And just when you go to extract it, it snaps off. And so I would, um, number one, I would always section multi-rooted tooth or teeth, no matter how loose or how extensive the periodontal disease is. You want to create a large enough flap so that you can get into the alveolar mucosa and, and pull that over. You don't want to stretch it over. You just want to lay it over the socket. If you have to stretch it or pull it over, then there's not enough um, of a flap. But the other point is, is that you want to do a very a full thickness flap. So when you're creating that flap, especially over that root, you want to, you want to take that periosteal uh, elevator and get right down onto the bone to create a full thickness flap um, so that you have that periosteum to cover that socket as well. Um, I think a lot of people don't remove enough alveolar bone. I generally will remove about 50% of the bone uh, almost on, on every tooth. Um, and I think, I, I don't think, I know I avoid fracturing more roots. Um, if I need to remove more alveolar bone, then I will. So make sure that you re remove enough alveolar bone. I'm going to make a comment about removing the mesial and distal alveolar bone because I think that that's a problem that we have, um, especially with the, uh, with the upper and lower canine teeth. And I'm going to show you that in just a second. And as I said earlier, if you need to remove more buccal bone, then remove it. Once you extract the tooth, um, you need to have a diamond burr, and I'll show you an example of that, where you can just smooth off those alveolar ridges so that when you lay that flap over, it's it's very um, it's a smooth um, piece of bone rather than having a bone spicules rub up against that flap, uh, which would potentially cause uh, more of a dehiscence. So in this again, an example is even if you have deep pockets, I would still get in the habit of uh, removing or sectioning the tooth and removing enough bone. I still would remove about 50% of the bone here. Um, we know that there's quite a bit of space between the ventral cortex and the root, um, but still, I know there's 75% of the bone loss here. I may be able to just grab that crown of the root um, and twist and hold that out of the socket, where here I may have to remove more buccal bone. And then in this particular case, the same scenario. We know we have extensive horizontal bone loss. 
uh, there's more than 50% of the bone loss on all these roots here. And so even though the tooth or teeth may be mobile, again, section the root. And in this particular case, with these two teeth, um, since there's already extensive bone loss present, almost 60% or more than that, you, uh, in my opinion, what I would do is try to grab the crown the forceps and twist on its long axis and hold that one direction and then twist and hold it in a different direction versus going in there with an elevator and torquing that because then you can risk breaking this jaw. So most people would look at that and, and absolutely freak out, um, and I get that. But if you were to section this here and, again, do less elevating uh, and more twisting and holding, uh, you're going to fracture less jaws and you're gonna fracture less roots. So these examples um, are, are to show you um, two things. Number one, generally speaking, uh, I would remove about 50% of the bone um, in both upper and lower canine teeth. Now, obviously, if there's advanced periodontal disease, that would be different. But what happens um, in a situation like this is that people only remove the buccal bone. Um, and again, I would remove probably half of that. But what people don't do as much as I think they should is that they don't remove them as much distal bone and, and mesial bone. So in other words, keep in mind that the tooth is in that socket. And so you're just removing the buccal bone here to expose that. But you all, and then you, and then you wonder why the jaw or the tooth isn't being elevated easily. Keep in mind that this alveolar bone goes all the way around the tooth. So what you need to do is that you need to remove uh, with a cross-cut fissure burr or maybe a size two um, or one round cutting burr. You need to remove a, um, that space mesial and that space distal because if you just remove this area here, um, you're going to have a hard time. So you you need to make sure that you remove enough of that, um, I guess, periodontal ligament space and the bone, the alveolar bone, on the mesial and distal surfaces. And people don't do that, in my opinion, enough. Because they just they, they see the root, they think that they're doing a great job. Uh, this is just probably overkill, but the example, two examples here, three, I guess, is to remove that buccal bone. Um, but then when you go to extract, for example, these roots, um, I would remove some of that mesial bone or mesial alveolar bone here um, as well as here to get the elevator to, to um, grab it a bit better. And this upper fourth premolar obviously is being extracted. So it's take, instead of taking a burr, we can't get an elevator right in this space. And so you don't want to take a burr and go right through here because you're going to damage that first molar. So what oftentimes you can do and should do is just take your burr, cross-cut fissure burr is what I use, and whoops, sorry, and remove a portion of that cusp right here. This tooth is already coming out, so I would I would re remove that cusp here, and then remove some of that distal bone. Then you can get that elevator in um, to that space and twist and hold that. So the football-shaped diamond burr. Um, really, it's just used to smooth off the alveolar ridges of those bone spicules. And the reason we use a diamond burr like this, the one on the right is a football shape, the one on the left is a round, um, is that with a cutting burr, with a round cutting burr or cross-cut cutting burr, if that, t if that burr touches the, the soft tissue, it's a cutting burr, and it, it'll grab that tissue and rip it. Whereas if you use a diamond burr like this, um, if, the tissue, if, this if this burr touches the tissue, since it's not cutting, it's not going to grab that tissue and rip it out. So that you can get really close um, to removing that, those alveolar ridges and the spicules with a diamond burr. And if you touch that soft tissue, it's not going to grab it. So if you don't have one of these burrs, um, I certainly would get one. Um, they're not cheap. They're usually, I, I guess there's probably better pricing now, but back in the day, um, you know, the usual cutting burrs are, are relatively inexpensive. but um, unless you can get maybe specials now, these football shaped birds usually are about $10. And honestly, when I was at the university, those would probably last because I only removed, I only use them to remove 
for bone spicules, they would last four to six months. Um, some, pe some people will use these diamond birds to remove the buccal bone, um, which is fine. It's probably overkill, but it's fine. Um, if you use these, those sort of birds to remove the buccal bone, uh, they may not really last more than a, a week or two because you're just removing that hard, hard bone. Um, but what you want to do is that when you have ridges like this and you have this flat that's over here, is you want to take this diamond burr and then just smooth off those alveolar ridges um, so that when that flap gets laid over it, it doesn't rub against it. Um, the other significant point I want to make here, uh, this is obviously an upper jaw, but upper or lower, once you make this alveolar flat, um, you want if you if you have to pull that over and stretch it, it's too tight. Uh, and so what you want to do is you want to, um, and here's all you, you may or may not be able to see, but this is all periosteum here. When you, if you hold that that alveolar mucosa up to release that tension, you just need to slightly excise this periosteum here and that will release that flap. A lot of people will try to release that flap by removing it right here by the bone. That doesn't really do any good. You have to excise this periosteum here to release that flap. The other thing, uh, if it's an upper jaw, um, you want, you can appreciate that there's that alveolar bone that comes around here. Uh, this oftentimes is hard palate tissue is firmly adhered to that bone. And so I would take a periosteal elevator and remove and elevate that soft tissue, the palatal tissue, away from the hard tissue. You're going to expose the alveolar bone. Then you take this, this diamond burr and, and smooth that off. So if it's an upper um, tooth that you're trying to extract and you've created this mucal periosteal flap really well and you don't have um, any tension whatsoever, then I would then elevate either the heart palate tissue away or the lingual tissue away if it's a lower jaw. And what you're going to do is you're going to create more space um, for that flap to be uh, to stretch a bit closer to the, the mucosal flap, and you'll be able to have more space to put the needle through. So um, smoothing the bone, number one, excising the periosteum, number two, and then taking a periosteal elevator and elevating that tissue away um, will help prevent um, and make it easier to, make, to close that flap. And this is just another example of smoothing off. You can see where this, this alveolar um, bone is kind of pointed like this, maybe a little bit here as well. All you need to do is take the diamond burr and just smooth that off so that when that flap comes over, um, it's not going to be rubbing against it. And this is just another example trying to show that it's not right here that you're removing um, and, and releasing the tension. It's really in this periosteum. If you can see that where I cut that, that releases that, that flap tremendously. It's not down here, but it's in the periosteum. That is probably the number one um, goal in, in making sure that you don't get any dehiscence. I like to use a blade. Some people prefer a small iris scissors. Uh, it makes no difference either way. Um, you just need to do it. So moving on, we talked about this, but I'm going to say it again. The flap needs to be wider than the rest of the flap. Um, you can extend that incision way beyond the mucal gingival line. There has to be absolutely no tension. We said that about 10 times already. Um, I like to use absorbable sutures like chroma gut. Um, a lot of people that are being trained now are using monocryl, which is perfectly fine. It just takes three to four weeks for that to dissolve. Um, the chroma gut in my hands works best because the extraction site's healed in seven days, um, and in seven to ten days, the chroma gut is, is um, absorbed and the socket is, is healed. So that's what I like to use. Okay. We talked about this. Um, we need to remove the nasal and oral sides of the flap so that, that they have better um, attachment with better space for that needle to go. Um, if there's epithelial margins um, of the defect, like in the oral nasal fistula, you just need to debride that. Um, and if I haven't said this again, I'm going to say it again, the surgical flap needs to be larger than the defect. If it's parallel, you're not going to be able to stretch that, and that's where you get um, dehiscence. So this is just an example. 
Um, and don't be afraid to take that periosteal elevator and go down onto the bone. You want to do a full thickness flap. So this white area um, is the periosteum and the red is the mucosa. You want to get down, you want that periosteum to go with the flap. And then when you excise the periosteum right about here, you're doing that to try to increase um, and release that tension on the flap. Um, I have had this discussion with several people actually the last couple of weeks. I prefer um, in all my extraction sites vertical release incisions. So I start actually I start where I want to end up and I make these diverging. Uh, some people will use triangular flaps, which is perfectly fine. In my hands, every time I've tried, not every time, but most times when I've tried the triangular flap, I always end up for whatever reason having to do um, make another incision. So I've just gotten the habit of making divergent incisions just like this, where the base of the flap is wider than the defect. And this is just the example. Uh, look at the, the lower one, where there's divergent incisions here. So this base of the flap is wider than that um, than the socket. So that that's the way I always do it. I don't do the parallel technique like this. Um, you can, but then you just have to make it wider, and I don't like to expose normal um, buckle bone over roots. So in this particular case, I just do the, the divergent incisions. And this is just an example of that. Um, just a real comment, I, I never use a blade. This obviously shows a blade. Um, if you have very, very sharp periosteal elevators, which you should, those periosteal elevators are going to do the same thing that the blade does. Um, and again, in my hands, I'm probably too heavy handed. Whenever I try to use the blade, I always cut the tissue here. So if you, again, have a sharp periosteal elevator, that is going to do, absolutely do the same trick as this. And that's just an example of, of, of um, the bone that is removed and don't be afraid to remove more bone than you need to. Uh, a couple of comments about um, uh, extractions of, um, of the root tips and the upper first molar, um, but I want to talk about what Minnesota Retractor is. It's not a shoehorn. It's a real, real instrument. It probably costs ten or twelve dollars, and that's just going to protect the tissue from any damage. So you can see here an example where it's just um, removing or protecting the tissue here, and it's protecting the tissue here. You don't want to use your finger. You can use a tongue depressor, I, I imagine, but this area here does a really good job of protecting that tissue. So that's, I would get in the habit, if you don't have one, you need to get one. What you don't want to use is you don't want to use a periosteal elevator like this veterinarian did um, to protect the tissue. This is like 12 bucks. Um, this is much more expensive and you can see where um, he has or she has um, irritated this periosteal elevator and pretty much ruined it. So now it's only used as a um, as a, uh, a lip retractor uh, versus using what you should use, and that is upper fourth or the uh, lip retractor, University of Minnesota lip retractor. It's just going to save a lot of fingers and a lot of tissue damage. Um, real, real quickly, so I, because I want to get to some other things, um, I would make sure that you have um, your dental elevators. Uh, an extraction forceps and bone curettes in one pack, and then your uh, needle holder and everything in a, in a different pack. And so I think that's really important to have that all organized. And I think if I'm not mistaken, I have a picture I do. Um, so all, what I've done always and what we did at the university is that we have an extraction pack like this that's cleaned um, between surgeries and autoclaved at the end of the day. We have just the elevators, we have the forceps, we have some root tip picks, and we have a bone curette and the, the tractor. And then you have a second pack that actually has the gingival flap pack. So when you're going to create um, a flap and remove the buccal bone and suture and close, then you have everything here ready to go and you're not fishing in, in drawers looking for dental instruments. So I think that's very, very important. The periosteal elevators, um, I can give you a couple of hands, but there's many different types. Um, initially, to get through into the uh, attached gingiva, you want to use a small elevator. What people tend to not do is that they tend to use this small elevator to remove that alveolar mucosa. And what I would recommend doing is once you use a smaller elevator, 
to remove that attached gingiva and you're in that alveolar mucosa, then 100% I would get a, a wider elevator. This is a Molt 9, and I would use that to elevate. Um, even in a small breed dog, I would use the wider elevator to remove that alveolar mucosa because what happens oftentimes is that if you use a smaller elevator to remove that alveolar mucosa, you tend to tear and rip and puncture that mucosa. So once you remove the alveolar mucosa to the point here is that you need to use a larger, wider elevator uh, to remove that alveolar mucosa. So that's very important in my opinion. So if you don't have this, again, this is a mine, I would make sure that you have that in your set of instruments. The root tip pick, um, is not used as an elevator, it's not used for deciduous teeth, it's truly used to pick out the fractured roots once they've ex been extracted. So there's many, many different types. If you have, at, at the university when I was there, I actually had a root tip pick pack because they're very um, thin, they're slender, they're more delicate instruments. So I actually had probably seven or eight root tip picks in a separate pack because if you take all these root tip picks that are very delicate, and put them in with the elevators, then they tend to fracture and, and get damaged. So uh, most people will have one root tip pick like this, which is fine. Um, you can see that it's very pointed and it's used to actually pick out those root tips. Once they've fractured and you can't get an elevator down, you can take that tip of that root tip pick and get that into that, um, that fractured root um, and, and essentially pick that out. So if you were to fracture something like this, um, more towards the coronal surface, what I would do is, um, that's a fracture, I would take a cross-cut burr, a lot of people are using a quarter round burrs now, um, and basically remove kind of a moat around that as far down as the, as the burr will let you. I typically will use a cross-cut fissure burr, um, that's just what I've always been used to. But you're gonna to try to make a moat around that. There's, uh, Danelle Hansen always talks about making a moat around that root. And if you do that enough, and you can get, then you can get that elevator in to twist and hold. If you get the elevator in and you've created a moat and that root is movable and you can see it moving, you are absolutely um, uh, on your right track. Um, you're really home free. Um, it's just a matter, again, of breathing and being patient. But if you can remove that um, moat around it and with an elevator get it to, to twist and hold, if, that, if you can see that whole root moving, you're, you're truly home free. You just have to be more patient. And this, you know, this is just an, more of an example of that. Now, if you fracture it um, and it fractures way below the gum line, um, and this is just an example of creating that, that, if you want to call it an osteoplasty around it, um, you know, what happens, especially upper or lower, is that if you trace too much of that moat and you push down in to that where the root tip is, then you risk getting in the mandibular canal or you risk getting into the, um, in the nasal cavity. So you just have to be careful about that. If, um, you know, again, if you've removed that moat around here and the whole root moves, you're okay. But sometimes you fracture it way towards the tip of the, or the apex of the root, and you just can't get an elevator down there, which is then where you use that root tip pick, and you wanna get that right where these black arrows are to try to pick those pieces of roots out. Um, again, this is a scenario where we've pushed that, the alveolar or the tip of that root. That's a very large root. I would not leave that. Um, one of two things after you, you yell and scream and swear and get mad, um, is you suture it close. Um, sometimes if it's right here, you can suction that root out. Um, otherwise, it's just a matter of going in here, seeing where it is, um, and you can see it in this particular case, um, I think this is from Dr. Klima, where you, you know where it is, you wanna be careful of the root here, so you wanna remove enough bone at the, at the, actually over that mandibular canal. Keep in mind, this is a two-dimensional radiograph. Um, so you can remove it right over that root tip pick and then, and then essentially pick that out. So that may be in most people's hands a referral, um, which is perfectly fine. Um, are there times when we just can't retrieve those for whatever reason? And if the answer is yes, I know, I know Dr. Hansen will probably kill me, but um, you know, if 
we are really truly going to cause more damage than digging around. You just have to let the owners know that this is a complication um, and you need to say this is what, you know, we have. Chances are that it may not cause a problem. We don't know that for sure. But what we need to keep an eye on is that we have to, to monitor that every year. Come in for a dental cleaning, take radiographs, make sure that there's no uh, true dis disease or infection around that because we may have to extract that at some um, point in the future. But most of the time, I think that we all would agree that in a situation where it's this obvious that they need to be extracted, surgically removed, I should say. Um, a couple more points, upper fourth premolar. Uh, when I when I extract the, the mesial buckle and the, dis, the mesial buckle and the distal buckle, really, um, one hundred percent of the time, dogs or cats, one hundred percent of the time, um, I'm left with a pal of the root. I will make a moat all the way around that pal of the root, even in cats. Um, and you have to keep in mind that this. I don't have a picture of this. I don't think, um, but this is this is really oblong. And so if you take the bird and you cut straight down, you're going to cut right through that, that, that powder root that looks like this. And so I always, 100% of the time, take a cross-cut fisher burr and I remove that moat all the way around that root. And I remove more um, on the lingual side because there's, these teeth are already gone. Um, and then I just twist and hold. And if you get in the habit of doing that, you'll be able to identify that root. Keep in mind that teeth don't bleed, bone does. So you'll be able to identify that root really easily. Upper fourth or upper first molar, there's obviously three roots. This is where you section them. I section through it here, even if there's disease present, and then all the way across. The point I wanted to make here is that once you've sectioned these roots, if you're not sure, just take an elevator in between and very, very gently rotate them. And if all the roots move, then you know you've sectioned them. Generally, we're going to then extract the upper, or the distal, the pal, I'm sorry, the buckle roots, and you're gonna be left with that pal of the root. What you don't wanna do when you do that, and I, mean, I know we're running out of time, but I wanna make sure that I show this to you, is that that pal of the root is very stout and it's very short. And so what happens sometimes is that if you, if you go in, sorry about this, if you go in and try to remove that and you put the elevators toward the, the orbit or toward the max, maxilla, you, because there's so much disease present, you oftentimes um, penetrate that orbit or the, or the maxillary sinuses. To avoid that, what you need to do is you need to take the elevator, put um, more, a large wide elevator um, more, more parallel to the heart palate, and then you need to use the, uh, the edge of that, and you have to kind of um, scoop that out. And I think I have a picture of this, um, I do. So you don't wanna take that elevator straight into the orbit. You wanna take it more parallel, and then you just kind of elevate, as it's showing right here, um, just kind of scoop that out, not with the tip of the elevator, but the edge of it. And if you just scoop that out, it generally comes, comes right out because that root uh, is smaller, it's more stout, it's more triangular. Um, so to avoid getting into the, into the orbit or the maxillary sinuses, this is really, really important. Once you've ex sectioned these and extracted the, pal or the buckle roots, that's easy uh, because you just essentially have to scoop that out, if that makes sense, I hope. Ergonomically, um, it's important that you are straight up and down like this. So here, Larry is, has good lighting, and you can see where his back is straight up. Um, that's the way it should be. Um, luckily, he has the University of Minnesota cap on, so that's good. Um, from a standpoint of, of you know, what you have at your hospital, um, I personally like uh, these, uh, this setup where you have a surgery table. You don't need plumbing. Um, you can tilt it up a little bit. You can put a, a, um, a little pail here for the water to run out, or you can have something like this that's more stationary. The important point here is that you just need um, a, a space for the knees. Um, otherwise, it's gonna be much more difficult. You don't wanna use a table that can't, or a chair that, that goes up and down. Uh, it's important that you have some type of a, a, a stool. Of course, I like an er ergonomic chair. The ones at the university were, uh, they still have to this day, and I bought them, 
I don't know how many years ago, 15 years ago, they were not inexpensive. They're probably close to $1,000, but again, they are still using the same chairs as I bought, you know, when I, when I started at the university. You can um, go on eBay and you can get um, generic saddle chairs like this for probably under $200, if not less than that. But it's very, very important because it, this basically forces you to, it's a stand up sit down in between, so it makes makes you um, stand up straight, and I think that's really important. Oh, good. So um, I couldn't see Nicole any questions that people may have, so we have I guess about five minutes or so. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions, Nicole, that may yes. have come up. Yes, we did have a question come up, but a reminder to those of you um, that please type them in the Q&A area and we will get to them uh, as fast as we can. One of the questions is, do most distributors carry the retractor that you were referring to? Yes, the University of Minnesota retractor. Uh, everybody does. <laughs> yep. Uh, Dr. Fleming wanted you to know that he wishes he would have seen this presentation when he was still practicing, but his images, your images, remind him how happy he is to be retired. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have any other questions out there? I'll give people just a moment uh, in case you're not a fast typer. Sorry, Pierce. everybody just a second but in the meantime I will remind you that after this uh, presentation I will be sending you a link with an evaluation please complete that is I'm already getting lo looking forward to 2021 and need some ideas so if you can contribute and also provide some feedback for Dr. Goldstein that would be awesome that will also include your CE certificate which I know is important for some of you uh, many of you, I don't think you need it because I see a lot of the same people on each month, so that's good. Um, I do have another question right now. If you had a very, uh, if you had an infection of one root tooth that extracted easily, would you still recommend closing it with suture? Um, I, uh, that's a good question. I can answer that um, two different ways. Um, I don't. Um, I don't close, I don't leave flaps open, or I don't leave sockets open because of the infection that's there or not there, number one. Number two, my philosophy, it's a bit different than, than how people are being trained now, but my philosophy is that if you create a flap, whether there's infection or not, if you create a flap, you always have to suture it closed. If you don't create a flap, you don't always have to close that. So the example would be an upper first, the most common example um, is the upper first and second molar. Oftentimes you're extracting the upper fourth premolar because of a fractured tooth, generally speaking. But the first and second molar you're extracting because of extensive periodontal disease. And unfortunately, by the time we see the first or second molar, um, initially we may not, it may not be very mobile, so we wait two or three years. But generally, when you're extracting the first and second upper molar, um, there's already advanced periodontal disease present. So when you section the roots or the teeth and you extract those, um, that area is either really, really inflamed or there's granulation tissue already present. So in that particular case, I may not have to make a flap because the body has already removed that bone from periodontitis. So in that particular case, I may not necessarily um, suture that completely. So, um, and there may be other scenarios too. If, if, severe, if there's severe periodontal disease, small breed dog, first, second, third, fourth premolar, um, if it's very, very inflamed, I would just go ahead and, and at least make, make it so that the tissue is more opposed and to, to close it completely. So when I make a flap, I always close it. If I don't make a flap, I don't always close it. Um, another question is if you could review the proper use of dental pick. The prop, um, so uh, that's hard. That's I'll try to explain that. The time. <laughs> yeah, so, so you, have, um, you have a small root tip pick at the apex. The elevator is too wide to get in there. So with the root tip pick that's pointed, that's very, very sharp. The idea is 
to get it to stick. So you want to walk along alveolar bone down to the to the, the portion of the apical portion that, of the tooth that's fractured. If it sticks, that is sticking between the root tip and the alveolar bone. And then you just you don't elevate it, you just kind of pick it and rotate it. And you oftentimes have to do that all the way around. So if you go along the alveolar bone with that sharp instrument and you just kind of elevate it up without twisting it, if it sticks, then it is in between the piece of tooth that's broken and the alveolar bone. And then it's just a matter of walking it all the way around the circumference of that tooth root that's or the tooth tip that's broken um, and just kind of um, lever it out and lever it or pick it out. And in, oftentimes, in some cases, it, it may take, honestly, 15 or 20 minutes. Um, it's very rewarding when you can see that, but if you, get that, if you get that to stick and you can visualize deep down and that root moves just a little bit, then again, just like the, the other scenario, you're home free. It's just a matter of just walking it along, getting it to stick all the way around that alveolar socket and then you're levering or picking that out. But it, it's not gonna take five minutes. It may take 15, 10 or 15 minutes to do. I hope that explained it a little bit better. Thank you. And I wanna thank you, Dr. Goldstein, so much for your time. We are out of time today and um, we do not have any more questions at this time. So I think it's a good point to end. So thanks everybody for sticking with us and I hope you have a great day. Thank you very much.